morning, church. Are you excited to be here this morning? Come on, clap your hands.
Come on, you better celebrate the King of Kings this morning. We love you, Jesus. Joe! 
to Siloam during this season of love, hope, and God's greatest gift to mankind, His Son. It's Christmas time, so you are free to tell your neighbor while you social distance that they look beautiful and that you love them. In all that we have been through this year, the season of Christmas opens for some of us 
a time of joy and celebration. For others, a time of grieving, a time of reflection, and a time of gratitude. While we all continue to pray for those infected, affected, and all our healthcare workers that work on the front line during this pandemic, we continue to pray for them. Thank you to one and all for making our church your home and for showing up in person or in your pajamas online to worship and fellowship with us. We extend to you and your family festive Christmas greetings and a blessed new year and a prosperous one. While Christmas is a season of giving, actually our Christian lives should always be about giving. While we're currently facing a pandemic, it is my strong belief that, as Dad has preached many years before, that there's always been a pandemic around, and it's one of spiritual emptiness. And it's been around for a lot longer than COVID-19. Surely, the current pandemic has highlighted to you and I that there must be more to life. It can't be waking up, going to work, coming home, watching Netflix, going to bed. Or for the younger generation, waking up late, going to school, coming home, some doing their homework, on TikTok, and going to bed. There must be more to life. And I've also asked myself the question, am I living or just existing? And the reason why us as humans ask ourselves this question is because we are trying to find out what is our significance or what is the meaning to life or what is our purpose. And as a Christian, I believe that I'm called to be a steward. In every area, it's called stewardship. Called to take care of things entrusted to you and I in your jobs, in whatever you do. If you are entrusted with affluence and influence, then you are entrusted with this to be a steward. Why? To help the marginalized, to help the foreigner, to help the widowed, and to help the orphaned, but also to help the kingdom in advancing this good news message. So I'm reminded of the story of Moses found in Exodus 4, when God asked him, what do you have in your hand? Now, if God ever asks you a question, he can't be God if he didn't know the answer. So he's asking it for your benefit, not for his. So Moses answered, he had a staff, not a HR guy with staff, just, you know, that stick. And uh, God says, throw it on the ground, throw it down. And it turns into a serpent and he steps, he was afraid. And then he picks it up, God says, pick it up by the tail. And it turns back into a staff. Now, for most watching online, you think, okay, this is where the prophets in Africa get this from. But it's not that. God can show up in many ways. And um, the staff is what I want to talk about. It represents three things about Moses' life. Number one, it represented his identity. He was a shepherd. It was a symbol of his occupation. I mean, like none of you go and buy a stethoscope and walk around the mall. So they think you're a doctor. No. So then, it was a symbol, number two, of his income. Because sheep equaled assets in modern day times. And then number three, it was a symbol of his influence. With the staff, you direct things. You push them, you pull them, you make things happen. So God will ask you and I the same question. What do you have in your hand? And it could be your identity, it could be your income, it could be your influence. And he says, when you lay these things down like the staff, it then comes alive. Anything only in your hands remains dead. And when he makes these things come alive, he makes them good. So for those of you that are watching us online, and those of you that are seated here, what do you have in your hands? What are your talents, your networks, your ideas, your wealth? Use them in the kingdom and watch God work mightily on your behalf. I trust that as the deacons take up their offering that you be blessed and you open up your hands this season 
and that even as you prepare your first fruit offering, that you remember this message, that anything in God's hand is way more powerful than in yours. Stay blessed. Praise the Lord. If Mary only knew. Come on, if Mary only knew. Amen. She did not know what she was holding in her hand. Amen. She did not know what she gave birth to. So we trust God on behalf of both Neela and I and the leadership of this house. I want to greet every one of you present, everyone that's watching us online, a blessed Christmas. May you enjoy this festive season. It's been difficult. I've never been to church on a Christmas morning and had a hundred people to speak to. Usually our Christmas service is packed up to capacity. People are waiting. People are queuing. People are being pushed. People are becoming angry because they could not come in. But times and seasons have changed. Amen. And sometimes it might get worse. So we've just got to hold on. When you have the opportunity of coming to the house of the Lord, get hold of that opportunity. Amen. Click that button. Click that link. And find yourself in the house of the Lord because there's going to come a day when you will be looking for a preacher. You will never find him. You'll be looking for church doors to be open and you will never find one. Amen. And we are living in difficult times, perilous times. And for those that are watching us online, I trust that you will enjoy our morning service, our Christmas service. And we want to wish every one of you, we want to wish you well. Amen. This morning, I want to speak on a subject called Bethlehem Ephrata. Bethlehem Ephrata. I hope that this name, the title of my Christmas message doesn't threaten you, doesn't bring fear onto you. And uh, you are trying to put together, what is this preacher going to say today on Bethlehem Ephrata? And uh, isn't he going to speak about Bethlehem's manger? Is he going to speak about uh, the wise men bringing gifts unto the Lord? We're going to look at Matthew chapter 2 and let's read from verses 1 to 8. Matthew chapter 2, we will read from verses 1 to 8, and then we will go to the book of Micah chapter 5 verse 2. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. Amen. Whenever you come to the house of the Lord, whenever you come to meet Jesus, whenever you get into your closet to pray, to come into contact with your creator, your maker, the only reason you go to him is to worship him. I trust that you're coming on a Sunday morning. You come to worship. You come for no other reasons. There's no ultimate beliefs in your life or, or actions in your life. You come for the one purpose. I come to worship Him. And you will find that the wise men, when they came to worship Him, they did not come empty-handed. When the wise men came to worship Him, they did not come empty-handed. I firmly believe because of the journey, because of the travel, because of the distance, they traveled with caravans. They traveled with quite a huge group. And the Bible says they brought in gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Amen? Gold for royalty and kingship. Frankincense because Jesus will be the high priest. And they brought in myrrh so that they could embalm his body when he is in, uh, on the cross as a sacrificial offering. Amen. This prophetic gifts were given to him at his birth. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. 
And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophets, And thou, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not thou least among the prince of Judah? For out of thee shall come a governor, and shall rule my people. I want to zero in on verse 6. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, least amongst the prince of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor, and that shall rule my people. Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, he inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me a word again, that I may come and worship him. Amen. Let's turn to Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is a ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from the old, from everlasting. Micah the minor prophet gives a prophetic word uh, that is written for us, that's found for us in the book of Matthew chapter 2 from verses 1 to 8. Amen. Now, verse 6 says, O thou Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, least amongst the towns of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor or a ruler that shall rule my people Israel. Now, you will find in both these passages that we have read, there are three distinct facts, three distinct distinct facts. Bethlehem, the place. Bethlehem, the position of the place. Bethlehem has a promise. So we find three distinct facts. The place, the position of the place, and the promise. Now, when you look at both the words, Bethlehem and Ephrata, Bethlehem means the house of bread. It means the house of supply, the house of abundance. Now, you cannot live in Bethlehem and be hungry. Amen. You cannot because it's a house of bread. It's a prophetic house of bread. In the same manner, you cannot be in the kingdom have kingdom principles engraved in your heart. You cannot be in the kingdom and be in poverty. You cannot be in the kingdom and be bound by fear, distress, anxiety. You cannot be in the kingdom and live a life that is deliquent. Amen. Bethlehem is the house of bread, the house of supply, the house of abundance. Now, the second name was Ephrata. Amen. Ephrata means fruitfulness. It may, literally means double fruit. Double, double. It means having fruit in abundance. Amen. When you are in Ephrata, you will live a fruitful life. Barrenness is not the answer. And I came to charge you today that if you are going through barrenness and famine in your life, in any area, financial, physical, material, spiritual, then you've got to come to Bethlehem of Ephrata. It means fruitfulness. It means double, double. Amen. When Elijah was leaving, he asked Elisha, what do you require of me? Elisha says, give me a double portion. When you are in the kingdom, double portion is your portion. You will always live double, double anointing, 
double grace, double life, double blessings. Amen. There should not be a time of famine. And then it means fruit in abundance. When you live in Ephrata, you will have abundance. Fruit in abundance. You will not live from paycheck to paycheck. From day to day, you will not live a life of survival, just making it through the day, making it through the month. No, sir. When you are in Bethlehem, Ephrata, you will always have an overflow. Come on, say amen. Say amen. Amen. So when you put Bethlehem, Ephrata together, it simply means house of bread, and the house of fruitfulness. Amen? Amen? Jesus said, I am the bread of life. If anyone eats of me, if anyone drinks of me, he shall not hunger. Amen? Ephrata, the house of bread and the house of fruitfulness. Amen? So, so when you are in Bethlehem, Ephrata, everything in your life, will be a life of abundance. No lack. No scarcity. Amen. Everything in your life will blossom. You will not experience a wilderness mode. Everything in your life will blossom. Everything in your life will be fruitful. When you live in Bethlehem, Ephrata, it simply means that you will always have more than enough. Say more than enough. You will always have, why does God give you more than enough? He does not give you more than enough to hoard. I was sitting with mom last night and I was just, mom was just browsing through and there's a program called hoarding. I don't know if you watch it. How people hoard. Amen. Every little thing they just hoard. Amen. When, when God blesses you with a life of more than enough, He does not bless you for you to hoard. He blesses you so that you can be a rivulet that can be a continuous river that can flow and give life. Because the scripture says, when you refresh others, God refreshes you. When you make good for others, God will make it good for you. Amen. So when you are in Bethlehem, it simply means all will go well. Amen. Everything will go well. Amen. Even in the midst of pain, it will go well. Even in the midst of death, it will go well. Because God is our refuge. Amen. Apart from being fruitful and, and, and being in abundance, Bethlehem had a position. It had a position. Number one, it was least amongst the tribe of Judah. It was the least amongst the towns of Judah. It, it was not significant. It was insignificant. It was not prominent. Amen. Can you imagine? You are in the house of bread. You are in the house of supply, but you are insignificant. Amen? Nobody knows you. Nobody recognizes you. Amen? Yet in the midst of all of that, amen, being least, not being prominent, uh, uh, not being noticed, yet in the midst of all of that, Bethlehem had a promise. Amen. Out of you, Bethlehem, O thou Bethlehem, out of you shall come a governor that will rule my people. Amen. What the scripture is telling us this morning is, Bethlehem has a nice name. Even though you have a nice name, no one notices you. Even though no one notices you, even though no one recognizes you, inside of you, Bethlehem, oh Bethlehem, 
Even though no one notices you, even though you are not prominent, even though you are not recognized, inside of you there is greatness. Amen? Inside of you there is a ruler that will be born, that will rule my people Israel. This Christmas morning, Amen. In the midst of pandemic, in the midst of hardship, in the midst of death, in the midst of trying times, in the midst of financial crisis, look beyond the place of birth. Amen. Amen. It does not matter where you were born. It matters where you finish. Most people wished they were born in Santon. Most people wished they were born in a palace. And sometimes you blame yourself for the place of your birth. Amen? The place of your birth is only the place. Amen? I want you today to look beyond the place of your birth. Look beyond the place of your position. Amen. Re regardless of where you are at this time, regardless of what status quo you are at this time, regardless of what brackets, uh, salary bracket scale you are at this time, look beyond your position. What must I look at? I must look beyond the place of my birth. I must look beyond my position. So what must I look at? Look at the promise that God gave to Bethlehem. And what was the promise? The promise of His Word. It says, out of you, amen, out of you shall be born a governor. Out of you shall be born a, a king that will rule my people. I, this morning, I want you to look at the promise. Amen. I came to charge you this morning and say to you, inside of you, there is royalty. Inside of you, there is kingship. I don't want you this morning to sit upon the promises. I want you to Activate the promises that's on the inside of you. Listen, for the year 2020, God has given each one of us a promise. God has promised His Word to us. And so many of us are not manifesting the Word and not coming out of our position and place and reaching our God-given potential. Out of you shall come a ruler. Amen. I came to charge you today, and I came to tell you today, you might be insignificant. You might not be noticed. You might not receive recognition. The place of your birth has qualified you of what you will be and what you will become. Amen. Today, nobody recognizes you. Today, nobody notices you. Today you are not living in a place of prominence. But I came to tell you there is a dream on the inside of you. I came to tell you that there is a gifting on the inside of you. I came to tell you there is business acumen on the inside of you. Like Malden said, there is networks and ideas on the inside of you. There is an anointing on the inside of you. It needs to come forth. It needs to break loose. It needs to be given birth to. And I came to charge you this morning and tell you that by the grace of God, don't look at the place of your birth. Don't look at the position that you are at. Look at the promise and say, Father, you promised it. You said it. You will make it true. You will make it happen. And Father, within me, there is royalty. Within me, there is kingship. Within me, there is God. And today, I want to bring it forth. 
So in the next season of my life, I can rule. In the next season of my life, I can lead. In the next season of my life, I can live a triumphant life. Amen. Now, Bethlehem is mentioned a few times in Scripture. Amen. It's mentioned a few times in the Old Testament. Now, I'm going to take the Old Testament and then we're going to link it with the book of Luke in the New Testament. Amen. Concerning Bethlehem. Now, for the first time, Bethlehem is mentioned in the book of Genesis chapter 35, verse 19. Chapter 35, verse 19. You will find when you go back home, read that. You will find that Jacob, after tricking his brother, goes to Haran and finds Laban. And Jacob meets both the beautiful daughters of Laban, Leah and Rachel. And Rachel was beautiful. And the scripture says that he loved Rachel and he wanted to marry Rachel. And the scripture says that he worked seven years for Rachel. But on the day of marriage, he was strict. And uh, instead of Rachel, he got Leah. So he worked another seven years for Rachel to be his wife. And all in all, he works for 21 years for Laban. 21 years. Amen? Had nothing. But the scripture says that Rachel was barren. Amen? She could not conceive. Leah conceived. And Rachel envied Leah. And there was an argument between Rachel and Leah, Rachel and Jacob. And Jacob says, am I God that I can place a seed or place a child within your womb? Am I God that I could create that miracle? We find that Rachel was very, very envious. But the scripture goes on to say that sooner or later, Rachel was barren for plus minus 20 years. And the scripture says that she conceived and she bore Jacob, a beautiful son called Joseph. And Jacob loved Joseph, and he loved Rachel very dearly. And Rachel falls pregnant again. And uh, as Rachel falls pregnant again, it is around that time that Jacob decides that he wants to take his family back home. And he has a meeting with Laban, and Laban releases him with all of his cattle, his goods, his belongings, his servants, and they are on the way. On their way, Genesis chapter 35, verse 19, Rachel is pregnant. She's about to deliver. And the scripture says, and Rachel died, and she was buried in the way to Ephrata, which is Bethlehem. At this place, Bethlehem, Ephrata, J uh, uh, Rachel gives birth, but in this time of childbearing, the Bible says she dies. Amen. She dies. And the handmaid keeps his name Benoni, meaning son of sorrow. Amen. But Jacob says he shall not be called Benoni. Call him Benjamin, son of my right hand, son of my authority. Amen. A day of joy turned to a day of mourning. A day of joy and celebration turned to a day of sorrow. A day of uh, 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 laughter turned to a day of disappointment. A day of uh, joy turned to a day of broken dreams. A day of joy turned to a day of pain and a day of loss. How many times you get up in the morning joyful? You get up in the morning excited? How many times you get out of bed and it is a 
bright day, a day of celebration. But through the day, the day turns to a day of sorrow. That day turns to a day of pain. That day turns to a day of broken dreams. That day turns to a day of loss. May God bless you on that day. When that day comes upon your life, may God turn your mourning to joy. May God turn your loss to profit. May God turn your broken dreams to success. Amen. This indeed, Benjamin was indeed the last son of Jacob. Amen. Now Jacob and his 11 boys, Benjamin, the last one, who is a baby, are witnessing the death of Rachel. And it comes into their memory and comes into their mind that Bethlehem is a place of sorrow, a place of death, a place of pain. Amen. The next time we read Bethlehem is found in the book of Ruth. Ruth chapter 1 verse 1. Ruth chapter 1 verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was famine in the land and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab. He and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elmelech, and in the, the name of his wife was Naomi. Bethlehem, in this chapter, in this verse, amen, Bethlehem is now going through famine. It's going through lack. It's going through scarcity. And we find that uh, uh, Elmelech leaves the house of bread, the house of plenty, because it's going through famine, it's going through scarcity, it's growing through lack. He leaves Bethlehem and he goes to Moab. Moab is not a good place. It's a place of death where men are killed. It's a place of death where all of these women, Naomi, Ophrah, and Ruth, lost their husbands. And they leave Moab and they come back to Bethlehem. Amen. There will always be seasons in our life. Amen. There will be seasons of plenty, seasons of abundance, seasons of greatness, seasons of good health. There will also be a season of scarcity. A season of famine. A season of dryness. You, there will always be seasons of summer. And there will be seasons of winter. There will be seasons of plenty. And a seasons of wilderness. Listen, you must be able as a child of God. Who is in the kingdom of God. To manage different seasons in your life. Amen. Amen. We find that when there was scarcity, they leave the house of bread and they go to Moab, the house of death. Never leave the house of bread. Never leave the house of the kingdom. Amen. When there are difficult seasons in your life, you need to hold on to God. Amen. Because Bethlehem was going through a season. The third place we find the, the name Bethlehem mentioned, it's found for us in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1. And the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn over Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fall thine horn with oil. Amen. And I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king amongst his sons. And Samuel did which the Lord spake and came to Bethlehem. In the book, and verse 4 says, And Samuel did which the Lord said and spake. And he came to Bethlehem to the house of Jesse to find a king. Amen. Amen. We find Saul being rejected because of disobedience. And, and the Lord speaks to Samuel and says, go to Bethlehem for I will send you to the house of Jesse. Amen. And 
at the house of Jesse, there will be a king, a coming king. Now, in this chapter, in this verse, we find, we find Bethlehem, the place of discovery, the place of favor, and the place of anointing. Amen? The place of discovery, the place of favor, and the place of anointing. Amen. I pray today that in the name of Jesus Christ, that at this Christmas, you will come to the place of discovery. You will discover who you are in Christ. So many of us do not discover who we are. We think that we are created to be a nobody. But I pray today that you will discover who you are. You will discover your anointing. You will discover your grace. You will discover the ability, the talent, the gifting that's on the inside of you. I pray today that at this Christmas, when you come to Bethlehem, you will, you will be covered with the favor of God, the grace of God, the loving kindness of God, the mercies of God. Amen. And I pray today that even as Samuel came to Bethlehem, he came for one reason. He came to discover a king, a city that was insignificant, a city that was not prominent, a city that was not known, a city that had a good name but had a, a, a bad choice. Listen, the city of Bethlehem was leased, but it had a promise. It was least. It was not known. But listen, in this city, there's discovery. In this city, there's favor. In this city, there's anointing. Amen. A king was discovered. The king was anointed. And favor came upon the king came upon Bethlehem. I trust today that you will discover, you will walk in divine favor, and you will walk in God's anointing. Amen. When we go quickly to the book of Luke chapter 2, we find that Joseph moves from Galilee of Nazareth and he goes to Bethlehem because it's time for taxation. Amen. It's similar to Rachel. It's time for taxation. And he takes his pregnant wife and he goes to Bethlehem. And while people were paying their taxes, Mary is about to conceive. In this panic, he goes from inn to inn. He goes from hotel rooms to hotel rooms. He goes from place to place looking for a place for Mary to conceive and give birth to a child. He could not find any. Panic, fear got hold of him. And can you imagine at this time, it's reflection of the mind. It was at Bethlehem. I remember my dad. I remember families telling me stories about how Jacob lost his wife, how Rachel died right here in Je Bethlehem. Rachel died. Amen. Fear was running through his mind. What will become of me? What will happen today? Will I lose Mary? Will I lose this beautiful gift that God has promised me? And he say, he, all of this fear was playing in his mind. And he began to worry. But I came to tell you today, when God is in control, we need not fear. When God is in control and when we cast all of our cares to Him, the promise will come alive. The devil will try to kill the dream carrier. 
the devil will try to kill the dream. But I came to charge you today. What God has spoken, he will bring it to pass. What God has promised, he will bring it to pass. I came to tell you today, the dream carrier will not die. You are a dream carrier. You will not die in this time of COVID. You are a dream carrier. Your dream will not die in the season of famine. You are a dream carrier. You will not shatter or faint. Amen. Amen. The, and, and this morning, I want to encourage you today. You might be at a bad place. Everything might be going bad with you. COVID has, 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 has struck all of us. And so many of us are in a bad place. And so many of us are stricken with pain. Amen. Everything that's happening to you is bad. It's like fate after fate, death, despondencies. And then you are asking yourself the question like Malden says, is this life? Is this how life should be? Is this how life will end? Will this be my story and how will my children relate to my story? How will my next legacy relate to my story? I came to encourage you this morning, on this Christmas morning, that when Jesus was born, the first fruit, the firstborn, when he was born in Bethlehem's manger, he came for one reason, he came to change your story. Amen. He came to give dream carriers life again. He came to deliver the dream that you have that's about to die. He came to restore and give it life again. Amen. Bethlehem, the place of sorrow, the place of death, the place of pain, the place of scarcity, the place of lack, the place of, of, of no overflow. Amen. When Samuel came to Bethlehem, he reversed the curse. It became the place of discovery. I came to tell you today that your pain will flee and you will discover life again. I came to tell you that even though the favor of God is as seemingly eradicated from your life, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in a manger, number one, to deliver you. Number two, to give, forgive you of your sins. Number three, to reconcile you back to God. Number three, to turn your scarcity into wholeness, to turn your scarcity into plenty, to turn your pain into joy. And this season of Christmas at Bethlehem, may you discover, may you flow in God's anointing, and may you be anointed for the next season of your life. Let's bow our heads together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just want to say thank you that we could be found in the house of grace, that we could be found in the house of prayer. I pray today, Heavenly Father, may this Christmas day be a blessed day to each one of us. For those that have gone through pain, may this day be a day of remembrance when joy shall come in. This day has brought, Lord, this year has brought so much of tears and brokenness to many lives. And I pray, Father, that you will heal the brokenness of their life and give them joy again. I pray, Heavenly Father, in this Christmas, may they discover who they are in Christ. And even as we prepare to move into the next year, the next season of our life, may we be anointed with grace to have peace 
and continue with victory. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't forget, the Sunday morning service is 7 to 7.